um, start the webinar. Yep, I'm here. Mm, Cornelius, startest du das Webinar? Ich glaube, ich habe hab ich den Co-Host überhaupt? Achso, ähm, wie startet man das nochmal, das Webinar? Achso, oh. Nein. <lacht> Dann fange ich jetzt mit der Aufzeichnung an. <lacht> okay. Ähm, hallo, liebe alle auf YouTube, liebe Studierende. Ähm, heute ist eine besondere Sitzung, denn es ist gleichzeitig auch ähm, Public Climate School. Ähm, es ist eine von den Students for Future Bundesebene, also in ganz Deutschland organisierte Veranstaltung, in der eine Woche in Workshops, Diskussionen und Vorträge mit Klimakrisenfokus an Schulen und Hochschulen angeboten werden. Ähm, diese Initiative soll Wissenstransfer in die Gesellschaft vorantreiben und wir haben gedacht, dass es eine schöne Möglichkeit wäre, unsere Ringvorlesung mit noch mehr Menschen zu teilen. Ähm, die Woche hat ja auch gerade erst angefangen und deswegen würden wir jetzt gleich nochmal im Chat äh, weitere Veranstaltungen posten, also das Programm posten. Vielleicht habt ihr ja auf das eine oder das andere Lust, dort mitzumachen. Genau. Ähm, deswegen, wegen der Public Climate School, werde ich jetzt auch nochmal äh, wiederholen, wer wir sind und was wir machen. Äh, wir sind Studierende aus Hamburg, die teilweise im ASSA der Universität Hamburg arbeiten und wir veranstalten bereits im dritten Semester eine transdisziplinäre Ringvorlesung mit einem Klimakrisenschwerpunkt und wir bieten diese Ringvorlesung sogar gerade an fünf verschiedenen Universitäten an. Wer also vielleicht auch in einem ASTA arbeitet oder einfach so mit Lust hat, an seiner Hochschule so eine Ringvorlesung mitzuorganisieren, kann sich gerne bei uns melden und wir versuchen dann noch eine, Ring, noch eine Hochschule mit ins Boot zu holen. Ähm, dieses Semester haben sich 2600 Studierende angemeldet, ähm, um Credit Points mit der Aufklärung zur Klimakrise ähm, zu bekommen, was in, eben uns auch nochmal zeigt, wie oder wo das Interesse der Studierenden liegt und was im Moment in den Veranstaltungskatalogen der Universität fehlt ähm, und wo wir natürlich gerne uns auch dafür einsetzen, das mehreren Leuten zur Verfügung zu stellen. Ähm, damit die Studierenden ihre Credit Points erlangen können, müssen Tests geschrieben werden. Ähm, und dann kommen wir jetzt zu dem heutigen Test, nämlich wird heute um 20 Uhr im Anschluss an diese Ringvorlesung der zweite Test ähm, freigeschaltet. Und ihr könnt dann bis, zum nächst, bis zur nächsten Woche ähm, vor der Vorlesung den Test bearbeiten. Also bis 18 Uhr nächste Woche wird er ge gehen. Und ähm, weil wir auch so viele Anfragen von den tu lern hatten, ähm, man kann sich den ersten Sechsten zur Prüfung auf Tunes anmelden. Die Tests sollten trotzdem aber schon auf Elias bearbeitet werden. Also bitte nicht durcheinander kommen mit den ganzen Anmeldungen und Plattformen. Ähm, ja, so viel zu dem Organisatorischen erstmal. Ich komme nun zu meiner Anmoderation und zum heutigen Vortrag, der auf Englisch sein wird und deswegen werde ich jetzt noch ins Englische switchen. Um, we are very welcome to welcome Anthony Obutier. Um, he is today's speaker on the topic of climate activism or climate and classism. Anthony studied in Germany and Nigeria and now works at the American Studies Institute at the University of Tübingen, where he is currently completing his PhD. Oh, excuse me. <coughs> um, his expertise lie in comparative cultural studies, critical theory, um, arts and humanities. And he's very committed to support global partnerships. He's highly active and dedicated to work against environmental racism, which he intersects with classism. And um, this is the topic of this week's lecture. With these words, I want to give you the stage, Anthony. Okay, thanks um, so much, Lara. Can you hear me well? Okay, all right. Um, so I will just share my screen now. And um, okay. Just a 
All right. Um, good evening to you all. Many thanks for the invitation. It's an honor to join this progressive community of young people, many of whom I believe beyond the credit needs or beyond the credit points attached to this lecture series are rightly concerned about the future of this planet. Perhaps some of you are even gutted by the silence, inaction, and even outright denial of the establishment about these concerns. I thank Esther and Fridays for the Future Hamburg for being a great force for good, for organizing this lecture series, and for personally inviting me to participate, share, and learn from this community. I also want to thank Lara Thin, Lara Thin for the helpful correspondence which walked me through this process. To our dear audience, I hope the devastating impact of the corona pandemic and the horrors of war on the eastern borders have not caused you so much grief and emptied your soul. I hope you are well, and I look forward to an engaging time together on this virtual platform. This evening, I would like to share with you some environmental narratives from the brinks of our world, divided into the so-called global north and south, plain borders of economic class, in my opinion. Under the title, Climate Classism, Orderness and Environmental Casualties, I will discuss some of the incredible environmental realities of people across the globe, across these global divides. I will demonstrate how Anthropocene, as a temporality of aggression against the planet, views upon the historically created class and racial structures of our world. At the heart of socio-political division of any society, I would argue this order is a dislocated subject who is further reduced below the dominant power structure for all intent and purposes of exploitation, plunder, and outright political dominance. With the examples of the Niger Delta region of Nigeria and the Mississippi Delta of America, I shall demonstrate this evening how social political classism for granted by racism through slavery and colonialism across the species, serve as a classical blueprint for climate classism in these oil producing regions of the world. These examples, I believe, would make visible the urgency of the global climate crisis and literally show you whose houses are already burning while the rest are still on fire. To begin with, let us be crystal clear about where we stand on this ecosystem, on the precipice. Hopefully, we share a common view of this. Climate change and its attendant catastrophes are not proleptic. And by this, I mean that they are not to be anticipated. They can no longer be outsourced to the future. They are already here. And across the global south and north, people leave the horrors of rising sea level, increase in temperature, severe weather conditions, acidification of the ocean, the widespread industrial pollution, among other catastrophes. While the disasters of climate change are not proleptic, which means they are not in the future, victimhood, people who suffer from these climate disasters are usually, or could be a source to the future. However, the lucky ones still enjoy the privileges of not living these horrors already. So this evening, basically, uh, for this lecture series, my argument would be to show how classism shapes the global experience of climate catastrophe. And by classism shaping the global experience, I mean, who occupies what economic uh, spectrum of a society, where do you stand on the global equation of things? Because where you stand, especially with the upper class, there is usually the access to mobility, public safety nets, and adaptation mechanism. So while someone would I normally complain about um, rising temperature, it's getting hotter in some parts of the world, a rich man will basically turn on the AC and would not have to bother about whether there's climate change or there's no change in temperature. I would also show you how the whole idea of class, where people belong 
in the global system significantly influences the thesis of climate change denialism. It does not exist if you profit from it or if you profit off things that accelerate the, um, or that make worse the global condition. There is a tendency to actually use all manners of um, tactics to deflate the argument. And then thirdly, I'm also of the opinion, and I will suggest tonight, that classism equally promotes political inaction and the policy paralysis that exacerbates this crisis. Somehow we've all witnessed the end of COP26 conference. I don't know what you make of it. And personally, I have my reservations about such meetings, you know, people meeting in a very cozy environment, probably if it gets too hot, there's air conditioning to turn things down. If it's a bit too cold, there's a heating system, people fly in there in private jets, you know, all manners of travels, like all forms of existence, which of course, the man who lives somewhere in the Niger Delta region, you know, that produces about 12 million tons of pollution, of my fingers into the atmosphere leaves a completely different reality. Or people in the Mississippi Delta who have suffered um, tornadoes and hurricanes, you know, they have really been on the front line of these severe weather conditions. When you juxtapose these two classes or these two experiences, probably these, of course, would influence such decisions. People, I don't know, human beings naturally. Um, have a very slow fit in challenging institutions that profit them. And finally, I would also, I'm also of the opinion that classism also creates the division in modern environmental or climate activism. What form of activism is actually the, is actually activism? What should be the focus? Where should you, what do we, where do we go to? How do we demonstrate? But again, because people live these different realities, we cannot have a unified form of activism. But again, because people do not protest or do not um, show resistance in a manner and a way someone else does it, doesn't deflect the position of the person or doesn't um, sort of take away the person's agency to be uh, to have actually participated in the course of making uh, the planet or um, the world a better place. So it, these four key points will be the focus of my of my conversation this evening, you know. So it's going to be more of reading out my text and at the same time speaking to the slides that I have in front of me. So, but I would like to go back to the very basics of this seminar or of this lecture series, the question about classism. I am very sure you already have an idea about what class is, um, what it means. We all have an experience of, of it. I don't know. Even being in the university to get a degree, there's still some sort of social structures involved there. But for the purpose of this lecture, and um, because of the global dimension of the conversation around climate change and environmental pollution, I would sort of use this very broad example of the global north and the global south divide to as a way of approaching the, the, the conversation on class, who belongs where and by what measures does um, the person belong there. So discussing the question about the global north and the global south, the work of the Italian sociologist Antonio Gramsci set the stage for public debate on the cultural contention between the north and the south. What actually is the North and what is the South? I, I'm very sure that um, a number of you must have heard or uh, read something about the Global North or the Global South. You may have come across it. I'm, I'm quite surprised and I'm also a bit fascinated by the fact that even here in Germany, centers for Global South studies are actually springing up. I know of one in Tübingen here in the University of Tübingen. I also know of another in um, at the University of Cologne. So you can find out that these centers are sort of coming up and because the whole idea of the global north and the global south is getting traction. Gramsci's critique 
Gramsci critiques the dominant economic force of the northern part of Italy over the south, thereby setting the stage for binary interpretation of society along economic and power relevance. In the second half of the 20th century, witnessing the implosion of colonialism across some regions of the world, Carl Oglesby globalized the idea of north and south, stressing that, in quotes, centuries of global north dominance over the global south have converged to produce an intolerable social order, end quote. Across various disciplines today, from economics to cultural studies, through political science, the global north and the global south binary has come to mark a distinction through history between the enslavers and the enslaved, the colonizers and the colonized, the so-called first world countries and the third world countries, developed countries and developing countries, and of course, the biggest polluters of the planet and the most vulnerable groups of climate change. The exceptionalism of the North through history has, however, hinged on constant interaction with the South. You know, you cannot talk about slavery without the conversation between the North and the South. You cannot talk about colonialism without the conversation between the North and the South. And the very idea of the first and the third world country, developed and developing countries, also comes from um, this North and South interaction because if, uh, if, let's assume, if everybody stood on the same pedestal, there will be no need to create this distinction and mark out who is where and who is not, who is uh, underneath. To better foreground the dynamics of this geopolitics, I will now turn to the examples of the Niger and the Mississippi Deltas to show how historical operation of classism and its attendant subjugation of exception of the society has trickled down to current climate crisis. So this is sort of a very broad overview of this global distinction between the North and the South, colonizers, colonized, and I'm sure you're very much aware of uh, this, whole, this whole narrative. But beyond what we read on paper, beyond the name, it is about a cultural movement. It is about an ideological push of what views or what ideas dominate the society, not just in terms of politics, but also in terms of cultural exports. And I think this is also one of the biggest achievements of the colonial project. In, in, in a way, I come from Nigeria, where Nigeria was colonized by Britain. Now, it's not so much about the horror per se, but the very idea that I can have this conversation with you in English, English is not my mother tongue, but again, it's part of the colonial heritage of the Nigerian society. Okay, so turning to my example tonight, the Niger and the Mississippi Deltas. Ideally, someone will ask, what is the connection? Because, and I've chosen basically the Niger and the Mississippi because Nigeria, is hanging somewhere here in Africa, and of course the Mississippi Delta is all the way in America. By every stretch of human reason, you would understand that these two nations stand apart in terms of slavery, in terms of their experience of colonialism, and in terms of their own experience of wealth distribution. So the Niger and the Mississippi Delta. So the story of Africa's largest oil producing nation, that's Nigeria, and the sixth largest in the world is confined to this. So on your right, on the right hand side here, the areas, the map, the areas marked in orange. So that will be the Niger Delta um, map from the map of Nigeria. So Nigeria is a whole lot bigger landmass, but then the Niger Delta is just that small piece of um, a uh, small piece of land laying by the Atlantic Ocean. So the whole idea of Nigeria being the sixth largest oil producing nation is confined to the 70,000 square landscapes of the Niger Delta region of Nigeria. At full capacity, Nigeria explores about 2.5 million barrels of oil per day from this delicate biodiversity of the region. Although a substantial portion of the Niger Delta is permanently underwater for most part of the year, stemming from petroleum extraction dominated by shell petroleum, inundation and the rising sea level, the region boosts enormous wealth, accounting for over 80% of Nigeria's foreign exchange. Here is the but. 
Gas flare in the Niger Delta produces about 12 million tons of methane gas per annum. And being already in the climate change and um, the disaster of uh, fossil fuel, you would understand what it means for Nigeria to annually put in 12 million tons of methane gas into the atmosphere. As a matter of fact, methane gas is considered by some scholars more dangerous than carbon monoxide. So, and Nigeria has consistently done this since 1958 when oil was first discovered in Nigeria. As a matter of fact, some uh, publication in, in, in the UK in the early 2011 actually classifies Niger Delta's oil as the world's biggest polluter. But probably enough of the Niger Delta at this point in time. So we head over to the Mississippi Delta, to, to the north of the Atlantic Ocean. In the distinctive northwest section of the state of Mississippi, lays the expansive plain of the Mississippi Delta, stretching some 220,000 miles from Pittsburgh to Memphis. The strip of land on the southern coast of America currently houses about over 150 behemoth industrial sites and petrochemical plants. According to rights, uh, Beverly writes, a human, uh, a human rights activist, an environmental activist also in America. She poses that the Mississippi Delta produces a fifth of America's petrochemicals, and the 19 oil refineries on this strip of land collectively pump out 17 billion gallons of gasoline alone annually. One of the most notorious of those oil refineries also is Shell. So again, you begin to see the consistency Oil production in the Niger Delta region on this strip of land is essentially dominated by Shell from 1958 when they first discovered oil in a, a state called Bayasa. And also in the Mississippi Delta, the process of refining oil in that region is equally dominated by Shell. But this, of course, could also be just coincidence, but there is more to this global connection. I sort of want to establish this global connection and make you understand how this fits back into history or borrows from the past or borrows from social structures dating back to 15th century. So you would naturally want to ask, so what is the connection? And then the connection between these two regions brings us to the history of plunder. So here in a, this very interesting text, we had the Vulture's Feast, or Runtime and Douglas make a claim about colonialism and slavery in the Niger Delta. And they essentially argue that the exploitation, the current exploitation of the Niger Delta region dates back to 1444 with the beginning of slave trade, okay? So slavery began in the Niger Delta way back from the 15th century. And of course, we all have, a, I think everybody may have heard one thing or the other about slavery the deportation of Africans into the Americas, the Caribbeans, and all of that. It seems to be one grand standing project, very massive. And it was also very, uh, it was also a very convoluted process because at this point in time, nobody can actually tell who went where, who came from where. And today we have to grapple with the very broad African-American taxonomy. But again, this deportation happened from different African countries. So this is the claim of Okuntan Douglas. He argues in, in his text or in his work, we have all just fixed Shell and the plunder of the Niger Delta. Now the ongoing environmental disaster in the Niger Delta, perpetrated by Shell and multinational oil corporations, actually dates back to slavery. Ideally, all of you would ask how slavery ended many years ago. You are very right. It ended, but maybe it didn't end. Slavery essentially metamorphosed, it transformed itself, it took on a new skin, and it held on to the old structure. So here is the connection here. Slaves essentially deported from the Niger Delta, many of them eventually ended up in the Mississippi Delta, of course, with the influence of UK, Great Britain, who colonized um, the region of Nigeria. And because the new world was founded by some American, uh, some um, British sellers, the Puritans, and, and the rest of them, and they had the dominance also in the Nigerian region, it was easier for Britain to essentially deport natives from the Niger Delta region here, 
all the way to the Mississippi Delta, and of course exported um, uh, cotton back to the UK, back to Britain, and then Britain eventually exported rum and textiles to the Niger Delta. So slaves left here, moved to Mississippi. The slaves produced cotton, they moved back to Britain. Cotton was transformed during the Industrial Revolution to uh, textile, and textile came back to Niger Delta. So I'm sure quite a number of you may have heard about the triangular trade. This is just an example of the triangular trade. I am not saying that this is how slavery happened alone. Of course, it happened from Nigeria, Benin Republic, Senegal, Burkina Faso, the entire region. But this is just an example. When you hear of the triangular trade, this is exactly how the triangular trade occurred. So back in the Mississippi Delta, the Whitney Museum Plantation, at base of the Bight of Biafra, centered on the Niger Delta, at the turn of the century, at the turn of the century, was a very uh, instrumental part of slave labor, the supply of slave labor to the Mississippi region. As a matter of fact, they show that in their, just on their website, Googling their website will bring you to this information, that many slaves who were deported from Niger Delta eventually ended up in the Mississippi Delta to work the plantation. And of course, they still say that some names of um, people deported from the Niger Delta. By the way, the Niger Delta wasn't the known uh, terminology at the time. You had something more of uh, the bite of Biafra and the bite of Benin. Okay, so we fast forward from slavery. So now these images here, you can see the, the um, photo right. These are not my pictures. They are from Georgia. So this uh, work on the rape of the Niger Delta. So these two have basically put this uh, college together to show different movements in the Niger Delta. So to your left here, you can see these two kids playing next to Boni Oil um, Terminal. Now, from the 15th century, this same place where the students stood, where these students are standing now, or are squatting, is also the same place where slaves were deported from Nigeria back to the U.S. However, there is a change in guard, and today it's no longer deportation of oil, deportation of natives. It's more about the deportation of oil. So you can essentially see the oil vessel behind here. So this movement from the Niger Delta to the rest of the world, and America in particular, has been on even with the end of slavery for a very long time. Now, to your right, you can see the reality of oil explore, uh, exploration in the Niger Delta. So the whole idea of gas flaring, you can basically, in the first picture here, this is a woman returning from farm work. This is a daily, a daily routine. And you can also see down here, um, uh, people standing next to a gas flaring site. This is not about um, once in a lifetime experience. This is people's daily reality. This is the life they, they go through. And then another thing to point out here is that the arrival of Shell in Niger Delta, because at the end of slavery came colonialism in the Niger Delta. And if you look through history, you'll find out that Nigeria is actually the only country among its neighbors colonized by the British. All others are Francophone countries. So essentially there was, uh, Britain held on to the power and the dominance it had all the way back to slavery. And they could sort of get on with colonialism and then from colonialism or during colonialism, Shell came on board and then with the transfer of power at the end of colonialism with independence, so to say, the military took over power. And of course, Shell had already established a very, uh, had established itself on very toxic and aggressive forms of uh, doing business. Now, in the Niger Delta, because of all of these things that I've just mentioned, the region, of course, laying next to the Atlantic Ocean, would naturally experience coastal subsidence. Some researchers claim that the Niger Delta is actually sinking at a rate of five millimeter every year. And this uh, publication from 2017, it's sort of uh, a very jarring reality that a third of the region will be lost to climate change in the next 30 to 50 years. As we have this conversation right now, people's houses are already going underwater. And of course, people are having to build their 
houses on top of water like sharks, uh, like slums. Even in some part of Lagos, you'd also see these massive slums built on on um, on um, canals or water. So, what does all of this have to do with the Mississippi region? So, here in the Bembe text. Um, Necropolitics. He argues essentially that slave labor from Africa went back to the Mississippi, of course, as part of destruction of the planet. So the whole idea that industrial revolution, I agree that industrial revolution did a lot to do damage to the environment. But beyond that, slavery in America was already the first approach of bringing down trees, clearing forests, and of course, changing the natural vegetation and the ecosystem for cotton, sugarcane, and, um, and what have you. So, but with the end of slavery came uh, a new, a new, a new approach. The end of slavery, you would also agree, came with the industrial revolution. So there were factories all over the place now, and Alice Walker puts it very nice that Earth itself has become the new end world of the world with the end of slavery. And for that purpose, we are going through this vicious circle of climate crisis because the Anthropocene, like you and I know, is about human aggression against the planet. So before industrial revolution, America and the world had, African-Americans have had slaves for the labor. With the end of slavery, we'll have planet to do to as we wish. And this is the payback of where we are right now. So we move over to the Mississippi Delta. This is about a movement, you know, we keep going back and forth from Nigeria to America and America back to Nigeria. Now this picture, this is a picture of um, shells oil refinery in Noko, Louisiana. And this plantation itself used to be a slave plantation in the old, during slavery. But with the end of slavery came oil industry. You can basically see the transfer of oil infrastructure on the same land that had been worked by African-Americans and by slaves. So this is the elephant in the room. This is Shell's, uh, Shell's uh, website, Shell Knuckle, Shell in Louisiana there. And their history is quite interesting. So here in their history, it says, in 1916, the New Orleans Refining Company purchased blah, 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 blah. And um, so essentially, Shell purchased this in the 1920s. Shell Petroleum Corporation, a forerunner of Shell Oil Company, acquired Knuckle Refinery in 1929. The chemical plant was added in 1955. So basically, you can see that Shell acquired this oil refinery in 1929. In 1934, they arrived in Nigeria under colonialism, and in 1958, they began exploring oil. So, and up till date, 11% of America's oil need comes back from the Niger Delta region. Okay, so this is somewhat a rundown of um, the workings of history from slavery all the way to colonialism and then from colonialism all the way to the workings of petrochemical industry in America and of course also in the Mississippi Delta. This picture I think actually says a lot about this transfer of power. So it's no longer just to say that it has ended, it has ended, but then it ended what came on board. And looking at this plantation, you can see the oil refinery behind. I need not tell you about the pollution that goes on here and about people who live around these places. Because if you look through the demographics of America, a huge percentage of African-Americans are still confined to the South, the earlier um, slave plantations, because even at the end of slavery, they remain there. But then with the coming of these oil companies, you know, from Baton Rouge all the way to... Um, Memphis all the way to Baton Rouge, you can see that this is also the piece of land just laying side by side the Mississippi River that plantations have been built upon. But again, these are places where these petrochemical companies are now built upon because they still need the Mississippi River for transfer of large cargo. So I would just play you now a, a, a documentary that I find very interesting about life in the Mississippi uh, Delta, and then we'll continue the conversation after that. This is the Petrochemical Corridor. 
an 85-mile stretch of land along the Mississippi River that is home to more than 150 industrial plants that produce stuff like rubber, asphalt, and refined oil. But the people who live here have another name for it. The Chemical Corridor, commonly known as Cancer Alley. In this part of Louisiana, cancer has seemed to touch everyone's lives. I have 100 people to meet. Has anybody in the room had anybody in their house die of cancer? Everybody stand up. Someone just passed away three houses down from cancer. Because I have one friend, I went and visit her on 4th Street on a Friday. And that Monday morning, I got up, I said, I'm going to go see Mary Alice. I got a call, she was dead. She died of cancer. She had three other sisters. She had two brothers that died with cancer. I'm trying to think who I know that died that didn't die from cancer since I moved back here. Now this, visited towns along the Mississippi River with Senator Cory Booker, who is proposing legislation regarding environmental justice to find out exactly what life is like in America's cancer now. Cancer Alley is littered with fence-line communities, neighborhoods, and subdivisions that run right up next to petrochemical facilities. In Louisiana, we have a minimum standoff, which is like 500 feet between a plant, an oil well, and your front door. That's how close they can be. Martha Huckabee and Betty Bickham live in one such fence line community in St. Rose, just blocks over from a thousand acre international Matex tanks terminal plant. And they're right here and there's no buffer. There needs to be a buffer. They should be m miles away, you know? But this is just too close to somebody's yard. Unfortunately, this is where our house is. So in, in a sense, you are trapped because you can't pick your house up and move it somewhere else. They say they both felt the effects of a 10-day-long hydrogen sulfide release from a Shell asphalt plant in 2014. That smell lasted for like a few, 36, like, I don't know the exact amount of time, but it was more than a day. And we had to bring the kids inside because it wasn't going away. Tests performed by the Louisiana Department of Environmental Quality at the time found levels of hydrogen sulfide to be high, either at or exceeding the levels the EPA says could cause harm. But I was having headaches, which I don't get. And within a week, Dawson was out in the driveway vomiting white foam out of his mouth. It had my mind where I couldn't function. I was having very dizzy spells and my ears were ringing and nausea and my husband wasn't feeling well. We just were not feeling well. So it, it was bad. You was nauseated, vomiting. My grandchildren, they were sick and we couldn't figure, we just thought it was a stomach virus. Nobody knew what was going on. I couldn't put it together and I got a knock on the door and that's how I figured it out. Uh, Ann from Bucket Brigade had somebody knock on my door and explain to me what had happened. Louisiana Bucket Brigade is just one of many environmental activist organizations in the area. They say their mission is to create an informed, healthy society that hastens the transition from fossil fuels. The groups have formed an alliance under the name Green Army, led by former Lieutenant General Russell Honoré. 37 years, three months, and three days I served in the Army, and I served as a commander. I commanded everything from a platoon to an Army. Honoré gained national attention for leading Joint Task Force Katrina. And I had never seen such destruction before other than pictures from World War II. And that's what it kind of reminds you of. The coast of Mississippi was absolutely destroyed. He now helps lead the Green Army to fight for environmental justice in Louisiana. The group says that by combining forces between local and national groups in the area, they can make a bigger impact. What we do is fight pollution. 
We're advocacy for clean air, clean water, and clean land, and protect the health of our people. That's what we do. But activists from all over say that taking on Louisiana's government and some of the biggest industries in the country is hard work. You know, Kennedy said the world just isn't fair, but here it's not just not fair, it's crooked and it's corrupt because big oil has, has hijacked our democracy in Louisiana. Our government uh, stands more with these companies that put money into their pockets. So because these companies back up the government, our government don't back up us. Well, we got all the energy in the world and this is what it looked like. The second poorest state because they've hijacked the democracy because they keep getting exceptions and exemptions to the clean air and the clean water act. It's just big oil. It's just crooked and it's all about money and they don't care about people. That's yeah, they don't care about people. Yeah, or clean air. They just care about you know lining in their pockets. How many companies in America get that kind of break? And they complain about some poor kid getting a free breakfast at school. They complain about some mother trying to take her kid to the doctor and she don't have the money to pay for a deductible and that's what they're complaining about? Bullshit. This ain't the America I fought for. This is not right. This is not right. Another problem with holding petrochemical companies and their emissions accountable for cancer is bureaucratic holdups. If you wanted to know what was the cancer rate in this area code, you couldn't find out. Why? Because the Louisiana tumor registry should treat that like secret information. You'd be able to release that data, but they will not release data in any population less than 16,000 people. Well, over half our parishes don't have 16,000 people in it. For example, population is just 8,122 in St. Rose, where Betty and Martha live. And there is no end to tribal data for the effects of living along the petrochemical corridor. Let me tell you this, the data show about one or five of us gonna die from cancer. I go by tribal data. I have 100 people in a meeting. Has anybody in the room, had anybody in their house die of cancer? Everybody stand up. Clearly a case where tribal data don't match what? Actual, because actual data is manipulated. I believe the people. I would not believe the government data. The CDC is a bunch of shit. People shared their experiences living in the area with Senator Booker at a local town hall. They talked about cancer, asthma, even their face burning from just stepping outside. Three months ago, I was diagnosed with breast cancer. Women tell me that they have miscarriages, stillbirths, problems with their skin, rashes, vomiting, um, lots of cancer, respiratory problems, asthma increases in children here, the adult onset of asthma increases here. So there's a, not just cancer, there's a lot of quality of life issues that affects the communities. Residents and activists are tired of talking points. Phrases like, the plants bring jobs or bring money into the area. They say money isn't enough to buy their health back. If uh, ISIS showed up and they said they would create jobs, would we let them in? And even bringing jobs, what's the difference with you bringing jobs when you're killing us with our health? There are a lot of thoughts on how to remedy the problem. Some Cancer Alley residents are pushing for companies to buy them out so they can leave. Others want to rein in emission levels or prevent companies from expanding further. In St. Rose, the residents know fighting back against these companies is hard, but they are starting small by trying to get emission readings from local plants. We just want them to be good neighbors and we want them to be held accountable and do the right thing. Well, we want those monitors, first of all, because it's not about money. It's about getting good, clean, quality air so we can have a good quality of life for our kids. I mean, we're of age now. Still, even with the community coming together, life in Cancer Alley is filled 
with challenging moments and tough decisions. But I'm not sure if I want to stick around for that. It's not that I'm running away from a fight, but at the same time, my family and our health is a little more important to me. If I can't, if I'm not, if something's not happening here, see, fortunately, I can do that. Some of these people can't. People can't afford to move. My house is paid for. So where am I going to go? I'm 61 years old. I'm unemployed. So where do I want to start all over paying a house note, paying insurance? I can't afford it. So we got, I don't, you know, I don't know if we can ever win this battle. It's a, a hard one. We just keep on doing what we're doing and fight back. You do the right thing. Yeah, you, you got you to gotta win if you're doing the right thing. Okay. Um, thanks to everyone. So this is actually the reality of life in um, Louisiana. And of course, this documentary, just 10 minutes, but this is just a snapshot of a bigger picture where you have 18,000 cases of cancer annually in the States, about 800% the national average. So if you then decide to sort of break down this whole, break down this figure, it means that 49 people contract cancer in the state of Louisiana from this petrochemical plants every day. And if you break it down even further, within the two hours of the seminar or this lecture, at least four people just contracted cancer also from this um, sort of petrochemical landscape that is entirely transformed from an agricultural system to a petrol nation. Maybe I will just um, wrap it up here and then I can get on with further conversation with the questions as the questions come in. Sorry, I was still muted. Um, so we could start with the first, um, uh, like, factual questions um, about your first slide where you showed this word card. Um, and the question was, do China and India belong here without limitations or discussion to the global south? But, um, like, yeah, maybe you can also... China and in, if China and India belongs on the global south, right? Okay. So thanks for the question. Uh, that, that's um, a very brilliant one because again, the 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 terminology is also changing over a period of time, and it's coming to people no longer look at it at a surface level from geographical location. Of course, it has a lot to do with geographical location because. If you think about the global south, your mind quickly goes to South America, Africa, and some parts of Asia, right? But why it's a bit difficult to hold on to that description in terms of economic relevance is because you could argue that there is a global north and the global south because there are people who are stinkingly rich and wealthy in the global south who can afford even more luxury than the people in the global north. And there are some parts of the global south that you would enter. You would actually not believe that this is a global south, so to say. So the whole idea is sort of also being transformed. Take, for example, a place like Australia. Australia is still very much engaged with the global south conversation. But then within Australia, the global south conversation comes from um, the white population and then the Australian aborigines. So the Australian aborigines, of course, becomes the global south in Australia. The same example also in the U.S., where the U.S. is fully a global north state. But with the example I've given you this evening, you can also see the reproduction of the global south in the global north. So it's a very um, dicey terminology that keeps changing and keeps taking on a new life of its own. I don't know if that um, addresses the question. I think it's perfect. Um, maybe one could add, like, um, <clears throat> it's also... A form of class which is applied here. So there are people who are very privileged, and other people are not, do, who don't have um, the same opportunities. Um, we have another question. Um, I really enjoyed your mention of Gramsci. How would you apply his theory on climate activism? This is more complicated, I think. <laughs> okay, I think. 
Gramshare already um, goes way, way back. But anyway, to be specific, could you narrow down his uh, central argument on uh, on um, climate activism? I think it's more like the combined activism of um, upper class, middle class, and um, the working class, how they work together to um, form a revolution or a change in the system. Okay, so that's basically um, basically uh, introducing Gramsci's cultural theory into climate activism to have this sort of synergy. Yeah, definitely, I would I would agree, and then maybe I can just share my screen and then I can move on to the next slide, which of course takes me properly to the terrain of um, activism. Um, okay. This is okay. So, talking about talking about um, activism and having a synergy between different classes, I will give you a practical example from from this image with this image of the Niger Delta. So, to the right, to the left here on the screen, you have Ken Sarawiwa, who's um, a politician, very successful businessman. He was an author and a poet, and he actually began the um, environmental activism in the Niger Delta from the 90s, right? And he was, he wouldn't really, given his educational qualification, because he was also a professor at the university, given his uh, social standing, you wouldn't really consider him um, the, the lower class or a commoner by every measure of it. But then what was the success of his activism? In 1995, on November 10th, he was, he was executed in Nigeria for calling out Shell for pollution of his Ogoni land. As a matter of fact, you can Google Ken Sarawiwa and Ogoni. It's, it's all over the internet. And some years ago in America, uh, Shell actually paid the family about $15 million in compensation for that, for his, uh, for his death. Of course, they did not admit to have killed him. But again, why would you compensate if you have nothing to worry about, right? So, but with the death of this, and he himself, he was of the opinion of let's have a mass mobilization. He is a professor at the university, but he didn't believe in elitist activism. He believed in this convergence of different groups of people, mobilize the, mobilize the village women, the village men, the young boys and everybody to come on board. So this is actually very fruitful. But again, this is what takes us to the class in climate activism because the social environment you find yourself determines the sort of protests you go to, right? You can basically have Fridays for the Future demonstration with police protection. Last year or two years ago in Nigeria, people who protested against police brutality, the military opened fire on them. So under such atmosphere, you find out that even the roadside demonstration, people no longer find it viable and they actually return violence for violence. And that's why we'll take to the second picture on the, on the left here, on the right, sorry. You can see a group of Niger Delta dissidents, and they have been in this business since 2000, and since the death of Sarawiwa. So immediately Sarawiwa died, nobody had time to march on the streets anymore. People were not gonna have that anymore. People basically, essentially took up arms. So. You, you sort of you're pushed to this frontier of uh, of uh, very very violent resistance, and again one other thing that influences the sort of activism is also the response of the companies you're protesting against, right? So in this slide here, this is an Amnesty International publication. It shows you here the ones I've highlighted here how Shell and Chevron have admitted to con admitted to their roles in contributing to the violence in the Niger Delta. Right. As a matter of fact, in 2000 and 1998 or 90, no, I think it was 99. Yeah, 99 when you had the Odi massacre. As a matter of fact, Chevron Nigeria helicopters and boats were used for the massacre of the village. This is Amnesty International's uh, report. So under such circumstances, we find out that in a place like the Niger Delta, no rich man or no upper class person is going to put himself on the street, knowing what could happen. And of course, people are increasingly resorting to this form of resistance, which is a bit very violent, 
extremely violent, the most violent form of fear that you can see. But again, because these oil corporations, the hegemony, they are in alliance, and you can see Chevron supplying uh, helicopters to level a whole village. You don't, when you're staring at the barrel of a gun, there's very little you can do with placards and, and signposts. Uh, it's very horrible, but um, thank you for sharing. Um, we have like um, a question which maybe um, is now very um, practical to ask. Um, could you give a few examples on how activism is a privilege and why it's very difficult in the global south to demonstrate? I think you mentioned beforehand um, the violence, but um, maybe you can have, uh, maybe you do have an other experience you could share. So, yeah, de yeah, definitely, definitely. There are a couple of other thoughts that also come beyond the violence, okay? Because you would recall at the beginning of the lecture, I made the claim that the disaster of climate change is not proleptic, it's not in the future. People are already living it right now, right? But then, victimhood is a big difference. Like in the global north, like nobody's really crying about, um, of course, Germany experienced some flood, unfortunately, some years ago. But it you wouldn't compare it to maybe like a place like Indonesia, where they have to maybe completely relocate the capital or something, you know, or the Niger Delta that is sinking, like people are literally living on top of on top of um, uh, on top of um, rivers. But the point I'm getting to here is that people's experiences a bit differ. So like this case you just heard now about the Mississippi Delta, people who are dying from cancer. This is immediate. This is today, tomorrow. It's not about Paris uh, and COP26 setting 2026 for something to happen. The man who contracts cancer today would in a very short period of time get to stage four and it's death. And this is where I sort of um, take a step backwards where climate change activism is actually very good and something we must get, go ahead on. We must also come to a place where we realize that people who are protesting this pollution, because you and I agree that most of the pollution we're fighting comes from the oil companies themselves. Like everybody is actually on the neck of to face out oil industry. But we are facing it out because of the danger it potents for the future. But it poses danger to people today, tomorrow. So if we can solve the problem of people who are challenged by Shell, Chevron, Ajib, and what have you, today, tomorrow, we would not have to worry about 2020, 2050 or 2070, um, I don't know. I don't know if that, if that uh, answers the question. So there is some form of activism, but the guy who has stage four cancer today, he'll be very worried about his tomorrow rather than rising sea level. Yeah, thank you. No, I think it's very important to um, share different realities so that we are also aware of our privilege and how we can maybe intersect this privilege with other people. Um, uh, so um, here's a question. Um, the question is, is the concept of classism applicable to the place you grew up in? If yes, how did you or do you experience it? And is there an example of how class affects the individual, sorry, individual and individual vulnerability to effects of the climate crisis? Yeah, thanks for the thanks for the question. And I'm sure nobody would uh, say he hasn't experienced he hasn't had an experience with class, right? Irrespective, anyway, apart from less, maybe um, if you're, I don't know, like a multi-billionaire, never had to worry about anything, if you're a sexual man, nobody has, you know, worried you about your sexuality, you're a man, you're very dominant, you know, like all because it's a full long list of binaries, men, women, heterosexuality, heteronom activity, upper class, middle class, black, white, rich, poor, it goes on and on and on. It's an endless list. I've just taken the global south and the global north 
you know, as a way of explaining that whole um, structure. So, but you would also understand that in the global south, the global south is an it's a very unequal society. I can I can I can assure you that it's a very unequal society. So I experienced classism also. I grew up in a very small village, you know, went to farm, you did all of those things, but then sort of went to school. At the point when I went to school, it was a lot of hassle going to school, like, oh, I really don't want to do this, but that was actually my way up the ladder. You know, but now I can look back now to realize that even the very small primary school or the elementary school I went to was a huge privilege because there are people who still cannot afford it. And because they can't afford it, they cannot escape that social cycle. However, my growing up is also, most some African societies, I wouldn't say all, I hate to generalize Africa, you know. Some African society is very, uh, are very, very communal, where the rich sort of cutters for the poor, and you lift others as you climb. You have a way of giving back to the society as a way of cushioning the effects of others. I'm not saying other societies are not like that, right? But this is one way of managing the class. You also realize your own privilege that you are in the upper class or the middle class, but then you realize that you have a, you have a duty to people below you to help support them so you can raise them. For me, in my own experience, this, this, this has been a, my way of sort of getting into it. And the things I can share, of course, I try to share and basically to help people. Uh, education wise yeah of course um well of course we have um the concept of taxes but we see how it doesn't really work out um uh, we have another question um about maybe nigeria um have you um, in your studies or research came across more examples of big companies falsifying official or public data so it benefits them maybe also in your um, home country of course this is um because of time i couldn't i couldn't read a part of my text where where such where i covered that data Okay, yeah, but I can I can actually think of two examples at the top of my head. Shell, you know, and Shell is quite consistent with this, even in the Niger Delta and the Mississippi Delta, containing my text here. So some years ago in um, some years ago in the Niger Delta, in um, in Bodo to be precise, the community is called Bodo. In the Niger Delta, Shell's oil installation ravaged the entire community of Bodo with over 100,000 liters of crude oil. There was oil spill; it ruptured. Now, Shell shrunk the magnitude of the disaster, said it wasn't as much as that, and offered the community $4,000 in compensatory settlements without remediation for the environment. However, the community went to court, and while in court, Shell paid 20 million pounds. Mm -hmm. So, of course, this is like, um, it's a very, it's a constant practice, right? Because for you to have paid for that, to have offered $4,000 at the initial stage, and then going on to pay 20 million pounds. And of course, while in court, they additionally admitted to an earlier falsified claims on the magnitude of the oil blowout. But this is not exclusive to Shell. It's everywhere. It's all over. It also, Shell, again, in a Mississippi Delta, in a community called Diamond Community. So they had a leakage and it released toxic substances into the atmosphere. Over 2 million pounds of toxic waste into the air in 1997. Shell denied the leak. So this is contained in the paper. And maybe a more recent example would be the BP or spill. Right? At the initial stage before the before spill come, came out, before the footage reached the community. Initially, they said it was only maybe 4,000 barrels that was spilling every day. It wasn't something big. Of course, they had the vehicle controlled camera. They could see it. Then when the camera was made public, the figures went up astronomically. I think as much as 40, 50,000 barrels per day. So somehow, 
people also have very, very good reasons not to believe oil industries whenever they give you information. And somehow also maybe not to trust fully in the system because from the documentary in the Mississippi Delta, it explicitly shows that the oil corporations are in alliance with the government. And of course, that makes it a whole lot easier, you know, like one with the government because the government has the police, they have the taxes, they control basically the entire system. So somehow people also have to move out for their own. But for the question, if I've encountered falsification of figures, this is standard practice. Yeah, I think it's also worth mentioning. Um, I mean, this whole thing is just because we want some oil in our cars here in Germany, maybe especially. And um, well, we don't think of that when we go to Shell. Well, not me, but other people. <laughs> well, but definitely, it's 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 um is a, is a reality. But we don't have to be hypocritical about it. We've developed a lifestyle. It's almost like an addiction. I can basically say that we are on drugs as far as oil is concerned. And withdrawal, treating withdrawal can be really, really devastating. It's not an easy task treating withdrawal, but that's unfortunately where we are today. Yeah, yeah, that's unfortunately. Um, so we have um, also a question um, from our organization team. Um, yeah. It's Friends for Future in Germany is known to be pretty not predominantly white and consisting mostly of upper and middle class youth. Um, what has to change uh, so these forms of activism can be more accessible to working class people or people of color? And do you think this is even possible with, with um, Fridays for Future? Yeah, I think, I think it's possible. Nothing is impossible. But of course, um, the first hurdle will be to get to the space where we put ourselves in other people's shoes, right? To understand where people are coming from, where they come from in terms of how they, how they join activism. It can be all inclusive. I give you an example, and then I come back to Fridays for the Future in Germany. In the US, from the ages when they began environmental movement, they had two completely different groups of environmental activists. They had the elitist activism that talked about wilderness and what have you. And then you had African-Americans who protested against siting of toxic waste in their neighborhood. This is actually how the term environmental racism came to be. And then environmental justice and environmental injustice. So of course, the first group of people, predominantly white, male, upper class group of people would argue about conservation you know, preserve this place and keep this place and make it. And then someone is saying, my workplace, I'm dying of toxic um, uh, materials there, right? And then you say, okay, yeah, that's a working place condition. But working place, it's part of the environment. You're not working on Mars or in Pluto. You are working on planet Earth. It's, you know, the whole thing escapes and everybody gets caught up in it. And this was what they did up until the 80s, but from the 80s, the face of environmental movement changed in America. And it was more about the concerns of this group of people. Again, it's also like where we are right now, thinking about the global south and the global north. People protesting, people who were concerned about conservation in America in the 80s, they really didn't want industrialization to affect these places. You know, but the guy who works in the industry is telling you, I am dying of pollution, so we should not build another one. But failing to see it from this person's perspective, and the person says, okay, I really have no problem with wilderness, but I, I really go there. How does that concern me? You know, but building that bridge and also getting to understand people's concern, I think that's one, one way to go about it. So back to your, back to Asta and Fridays for the Future. I think the, the, the network should sort of also open up. I'm, I don't know how you receive my um, presentation this evening, but this is a perspective probably you've not heard or you've not been, you're not aware of, you know, to sort of show the continuation from slavery to colonialism, from colonialism to oil industry, and how one builds upon the other. So when someone talks about fighting slavery, someone says, oh, slavery is all over, get over it, move on. 
but again, this lecture, I hope I've been able to show you how that transformation has happened. And this is where classism solves the problem. Because what people see, you know, people see the world from where they stand. So getting into other person's shoes would be one way to do it. And secondly, I think um, being very uh, sincere about it, also inviting people who have divergent views like myself to present a perspective to the climate crisis would of course broaden the perspective because when I began, this is also part of my PhD work, when I began this, like, okay, yeah, but, oh, this already ended. There's no connection between the three things you've just mentioned. And I could basically show and argue how Britain dominated slave trade from Nigeria. And when slavery ended, Britain came in immediately with colonialism. Before colonialism came in, ended, Shell was already there under the regime of, uh, of uh, Britain. Shell was already there for at least 20 years before, uh, before colonialism ended. And of course, the British also handed over power to the military, very aggressive group of people. It was not democratic, people cannot speak up. And the oil companies pumped money to the military. You know, they solidified the friendship. We are not going anywhere, we are here to stay. So you can see that sort of, so even the behavior of Shell and Chevron that you see in the global south, that's not how they behave in the global north. Because democracy here has been, has been here for a very long time, right? So this is sort of reality. So first of all, Nigerians are also, and people in the global south are trying to help their leaders get over this whole thing that is a new age and a new time. Slavery is over. Colonialism is over. You cannot shoot me for protesting. I have a right to go out and hold a demonstration, right? And so it's, it will be one step, uh, it will be a step forward. But I think having an inclusive voice and also inviting people to share their own opinion could be a way to help the, the project. Oh, I, I really enjoyed the, uh, the answer. I also believe um, in the beginning you said um, something about climate activism which was science-based by the elite and uh, climate activism by black community, um, more focused on um, industrial waste. Mm -hmm. And I think um, this also stands maybe for the intersection of natural and cu um, cultural studies, uh, natural science, science and uh, cultural mm -hmm. studies. And just with um, the different disciplines together, you can fight the issue. So I think that's a very um, good answer. Yeah, but definitely, sorry if I may just add this, you would, this is not to dismiss the elitist position because if we're going to get, if we're going to make it like, a, take, a, take Germany, for example, right? If people are going to depend on COP26 to make moves, to make very strong environmental moves in Germany, it's not going to happen, unfortunately. But again, you can see the growing awareness for Fridays for Future. This is grassroots mobilization. The Green Party, I'm sure, got a lot of votes from Fridays for the Future. Yeah. So it's a bottom-up revolution. So now they can form part of a parliament, right? At least the changes can begin to come in. Probably, I don't know, this is not a political campaign. Uh, maybe in the near future, maybe from Fridays for the Future and grassroots mobilization, the green parties eventually end up at the helm of affairs. So you can see that we can effect the change from bottom up rather than hoping it to come from top down because people top enjoy the system. They will not give up privilege. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I think that's uh, very insightful. Um, we have uh, one last question, but we have like um, 15 minutes left. So, um, uh, because you spoke about COP, um, yeah, if that, maybe you can uh, talk about that also, if you have any material on that, um, because I think um, it's always um, important to reflect on past um, uh, or, um, in this initiatives or um, organized <laughs> select series of um, Official, I don't know. I'm speak. I I don't know the English word. <laughs> Sorry. Right, right. 
Is, is that the last question? Uh, this this would be the um, for let's the question um, because we have fifty minutes left. So I would ask two questions. Okay. Maybe first the cop one. Okay. Maybe you can go ahead with the second question. Okay, all right, sure. Uh, so I'll just share my screen one more time. And then... Okay, so this is a, this is a, a very important picture I thought I should have bring to your awareness. You know, also talking about classism, who stands where, who sees what, right? So to your left here, you have a government of the Maldives having a cabinet meeting underwater to draw awareness to climate change and inundation of the country, right? You know, very, very, sort of very uh, bold step to, and then you can see the national flag behind it. And then to your right, you also see the national flag of Russia on the seabed of the North Pole. But to your right, these two pictures actually, they look the same, right? But they have two different purposes. It's as if these two countries are in different worlds and in different planets. So to your left here, someone is drawing awareness to climate change. And this land grab by Russia under, under the ocean was to secure a vast oil field that probably they would explore in the near future. Right? So you can see how people have a view of the world, a view of what is important at this point in time, is to secure more oil right now. Forget about the climate change conversation. It's not it, just leave it in in um, Nigeria. We say something must kill a something must kill a human being. Like everybody must die of something. It's okay. Let's just get more oil out and get going. But to your left, here, someone is essentially drawing attention to something more critical than oil exploration. As a matter of fact, if you can even stretch the argument to say that the man to the left, the president of uh, the world is Mohammed Nasheed, is actually protesting the impact of the right picture of oil exploration in the world. So this was in 2007. The picture of, uh, of uh, the Russian flag is in 2007. The Maldives uh, under water cabinet, as it's called, was in 2009. So this is just the picture of the president, but the entire cabinet went underwater to have a cabinet meeting. It was a very symbolic move. Symbolic move to show that literally, if nothing is done, this could be the future of some parts of the world where people permanently have to have a life underwater. So that would actually be the end of, uh, that's the, the last slide I had left. Um, I hope it worked well. I thought of also having this first uh, set of conversation and then talking to the slides as we as we as we move on. Thank you, and uh, also sorry for my English. No, <laughs> and uh, really thank good. you, Cornelius, for helping out in my second of need. <laughs> um, we have a very um, maybe complicated last question. What gives you hope for our future? Okay. Okay, maybe I would combine this question with the COP26, okay? Because I think the, the, the answer to the question, I have no, unfortunately, I have no hope in such organizations like COP26. I have hope in Fridays for the Future, grassroots mobilization, indigenous resistance, and people, and also every one of us trying to reevaluate our lives reevaluate our choices. And I think a larger population of the world now realizes that environmental issues are real, they are present, and it cannot be denied anymore. I think that's also 
like a step in the right direction, acknowledgement, and then we can begin to take action. Because I can't imagine um, COP26 agreeing to stop deforestation by um, only God knows when, probably 2028 or something, or I don't know, like still a few years down the line. So immediately I saw that news, I told myself, I said, by 2028, there will be no trees to cut down anymore. So there will be no need to stop cutting down of trees, right? And the whole idea of people having this very important meeting about people's harrowing existence in cozy offices, very comfortable, chit-chatting, sipping wine, flying private jets there. So I feel, I don't know, this might be my own bias, it doesn't do justice to the cause that people are literally suffering from those realities. But again, from COP26 now, we are looking forward to Egypt. This goes all the way back to when they had the first meeting in Brazil. And at the meeting in Brazil, then president of the United States told them there that their world and this world can never be the same. It cannot go into extinction. Like we are two different worlds. Yours might come to an end, but ours will not come to an end. And it shows you why America also has uh, powered itself with oil, you know, power the economy through oil. And it's as if every four years, Americans take a step forward and they take some backwards and they move forward and they come backwards. And, you know, that explains the, that explains the, probably the mood of the, of, of the nation. But I think the acknowledgement in the first place and building bridges, this sort of conversation where people can also bring different experiences on board, probably if we, if we key in on this, I believe so much in the bottom rather than the top. I believe a bottom-up revolution would just be the thing to save this planet. Because it seems the business establishment, capitalist ventures, and governments really maybe do not want to do the right thing, I would, I would argue. So you don't have any hope? <laughs> No, of course, there, you know, the whole idea, if, there, if, if we're completely hopeless, we would not be alive. The very idea of life, right, is hope in itself. But when it comes to environmental conversation, I've also come to a place where I'm being very honest with myself, you know, to say, sometimes not giving people hope makes them work for hope. Like you're losing everything and then you find out like, okay, yeah, there's nothing else to do. I just have to hold on to hope because that's all we have, right? But if going by the way things are right now, if one is hopeful, one is just being a bit maybe very deceptive, you know, which I wouldn't uh, or delusional, which I wouldn't advise anybody to be. But then my hope is anchored on such grassroots movements. With grassroots movements, I'm hopeful. So I'm very hopeful about the future. I'm quite optimistic about it, but then we'll have to keep the pressure. We have done great things in, the, in, the, in this world, right? We have defeated so much evil up until this age. So I think also defeating the evil of um, environmental degradation, fossil fuel, I think we would also be able to, we would also be able to overcome that at some point. However, there's a caution also because this whole transition also seems to be something we need to be very careful about, you know? Okay, we move from slavery. This was really, really horrible. We should not have done this. We moved to colonialism. And like, ah, yeah, we really put people through this whole thing for hundreds of years. We should not have done this. And then came coal. Okay, we'll find the holy grail with coal. We can power whatever. And from coal, we'll move to petroleum. Yes, this is actually the main thing right now. And now we are seeing the danger of petroleum. It's as if we don't count the cost before we begin. We get so deep into it and we're like, okay, this was a heavy mistake. And it becomes really difficult to go back. The same thing, I'm saying it because of the hype about electric vehicles, right? At the moment, they seem to offer a good alternative. Yeah, but the process of the battery formation, what do we do with the battery waste, right? People are literally putting their life on the line in Congo and around the world, digging up materials for this whole thing. So in the process of solving one problem, 
we end up, we might end up creating another one. So it just to count the cost before we get going. Uh, yeah, I agree with you. <laughs> and um, yes, I, I think lithium is um, one yeah, of the, lithium. yeah, uh, which is also, by the way, in these um, e-roller, e the things we are uh, the stand in the street. Yeah. So maybe delete that app. <laughs> um, okay. Um, with uh, these hopeful or more realistic words, more <laughs> uh, I want to close um, this lecture. I want to say thank you to everyone who tuned in and I wish good luck for the test you're taking in a few minutes. And uh, if you like, Anthony, um, we always have like a after meeting to recap what we did today. Um, maybe 